everyone. My name is Nicholas D'Augusto. I'm a professional actor and podcaster. You may know me from TV shows like Masters of Sex, Gotham, Trial and Error, maybe even as the small role of Hunter, Jan's assistant in The Office. I didn't sing the song. I'm another person that's here to tell you about how important it is to defend disability rights during this time. The pandemic that we are all suffering from has severely and disproportionately impacted people with disabilities. People that are out of sight are out of mind, but people with disabilities, they still require access to things like education and transportation and other essential resources that they need for their daily lives. And it's all been made that much harder for them during a time period where everything is done remotely and at a distance. Now, thankfully, there are laws in place to protect people with disabilities, but defending those laws and making people aware of their rights takes time and effort and resources. Of course, that's what the DRLC is here to do, but they require our help. So I sincerely hope that you will give generously to the DRLC this year and know that you are supporting people with disabilities when they need it the most. I wish you all the best and a happier and healthier 2021. Thank you. I am, I'm really energized and excited about the idea that, you know, this is a FDR, you know, titled event because, you know, I think that Franklin Delano Roosevelt really brought disability forward in a very small way but now we're seeing more and more visibility for people with disabilities because of the access and the inclusion that we've seen. And we are a young movement. We really only started coming out in the mid 20th century. Before the 1950s and the 1960s, we were either institutionalized or unfortunately people with disabilities were destroyed. So we have so much opportunity to build on and having, the legacy of Franklin Delano Roosevelt ahead of us is just something that I think we can all be able to use and motivate us. Well, I want to give a special thank you to Nick and Candace for that great introduction for Dear Elsie's work. And I want to thank everyone for attending tonight. Um, I know we're all virtual. We're all safer at home. I know these are trying times, but um, our hope is to see everybody smiling faces next year. Um, know that it's safer for us to be apart right now, but that the opportunity for us to be together in future years is is coming. So welcome to the 45th annual FDR dinner. And as Candace pointed out, I think it's thrilling to think about how far we've come from the disability rights movement. Um, but it also challenges me to think about how much there's left for the DRLC to do. Um, this evening, you're gonna hear from our supporters, our board, our staff and the broader disability community about the importance of our work and really, you know, what the DRLC has been working on over the past year. But before we start with all of that, we want to um, pause for a moment and give a special tribute to a board member who passed away um, on November 18th. Um, Harvey Safferstein was a board member since um, 2005 um, and made significant contributions to the DRLC. I remember when I began at the DRLC in 2016, Harvey welcomed me with open arms and a warm smile. He was confident that we were going to be successful and he was, he was ready to help and, and make his contributions a part of that. Um, he had a deep love and care for those around him. Um, and tonight I'd like to share, or I'd like to share through the words of some of DRLC's current board, former board and former staff, um, what Harvey meant to them and why he was such an amazing part of the DRLC's team. To Harvey, nothing was impossible. Uh, anything could be done. Uh, and I think his feeling is when um, people of goodwill got together and put their heads together, um, in some cases put their wallets together, they could help uh, change the world. And that's what he helped us do at DRLC. The man was a legend. I'm on the DRLC because about a decade ago, Harvey called me and invited me to, to join the board. And he's been an inspiration to me from that day forward. We'd have breakfast about four times a year where my day would start with Harvey's enthusiasm and Harvey's good nature and his jokes and just a completely upbeat spirit. Candidly, he was always smiling with one exception. 
And when he wasn't smiling, it's because I knew he was thinking. And whatever came next after that quiet moment where he was looking away and had dropped the smile from his face just momentarily, I knew it was going to be something that moved our mission forward. His unique contribution was making connections for us and also thinking creatively out of the box. Before there was LinkedIn, there was Harvey. He knew absolutely everyone uh, that there was to know in Los Angeles. For many years, uh, championed the rights of people with disabilities. He was such a uh, great ally and supporter, both of me and of the center. What I'll remember about Harvey the most is his uh, love for life, just his love for being around his friends and comrades at the DRLC, um, his love for his family, um, his uh, general joie de vivre. He would share with me pictures and stories of all of his grandchildren. He loved his grandchildren so much. He brought this tremendous, just tremendous sparkle to everything he did and really made it uh, a joy to do the work. Even when the work was hard, it was always joyous to do it with Harvey. It was always a joy to spend time with uh, Harvey, and as I'm sure others have said, it, it really was a joy for me to see his holiday card uh, and finally put faces and stories every year to all the stories that he had told and all the names that he had mentioned. A, a real friend, uh, really, to everybody who met him. He, he knew everybody and everybody and loved everybody and everybody loved him. And he will be very sorely missed. I miss Harvey so much and have missed him since I left. And I'm sure the Disability Rights Legal Center is gonna tremendously miss him. If you met him, you, you couldn't help but like him. Um, and he will be dearly missed. I'll miss Harvey. I will think of him every time I go past our favorite breakfast meeting place. Um, and I'd like to just extend my condolences to his family. And so uh, to you, Peggy, and to your entire family, my condolences, and I wish you all well. It's a wonderful tribute to a truly wonderful man. And if Harvey was here, I know that he would be sure to remind me to remind all of you why we're here tonight. Um, and that's to support our efforts to champion the rights for people with disabilities. And we do that by saying thank you to the people that have been our major supporters. I wanna say thank you to Gilead Sciences, to Munger, Tolls and Olson, Kirkland and Ellis, SoCal Edison and Latham and Watkins. These were our headline sponsors, all giving at least $12,500 to this event, all the way up to $25,000 um, and willing to do so amidst this pandemic. Um, and, and it makes a big difference and is a big help for the support and our ability to do what we do each day. Um, and it reminds me why we have to continue this fight. And so you can join us right now. You can make a contribution at any time during this event. You're watching on the DRLC's page and you'll be able to see your name appear if you make a contribution um, just under the video screen. And, and we'd ask that you consider an investment tonight um, and an investment that will go towards what we think is one of the most important fights that we have right now. And there are a lot of important fights and there are a lot of important things going on, but it's, I think, better shared with you from the words of our community um, that fights as part of these efforts each day about what your investment will do and, and why it's so important today. While 2020 has been very challenging for everybody, it's been particularly difficult for people with disabilities. The work for people with disabilities has never been more important. Both of my children have special needs. I have a daughter who has um, a disability. As a person with a disability, I understand the importance of fighting for our community's rights. I'm a person with a disability. It's not a, a visible disability, but it has been a part of my identity in my entire life. Um, I also grew up with a sibling with um, uh, physical disabilities. I myself became a mother of a child with uh, special needs. My older brother, David, who had a disability. He was bipolar and he was on the spectrum. And um, he he ultimately was unable to, to cope. 
and at the age of 41, he took his own life. He wasn't given the kind of accommodations that he needed. And so joining the organization for me in part was, um, was motivated by a desire to make the world, try to make the world a place where people like my brother are not forgotten. I saw very um, plainly how society treated my sister different than they treated me. And so we were both, uh, you know, given uh, different opportunities, I think, to um, and, and put different um, barriers in, in front of us uh, by society. And that was always very stark to me. I can remember a, a mother who we worked together to get her 14 year old son into a program that was appropriate for his needs. And she was crying, you know, and so grateful because there were no more resources for her. There's nowhere else she had the option to turn to for help. My son had food allergies from birth pretty much. So that's our life. We know him and everything. Our life is food allergies and we go about our life that way. And to try to put my son into school where they're like, you know what, it's a little too severe. We can't take them on. Or It's like, what do you mean? It's not, you don't have to keep them in a bubble. You don't have to, you know, there's just certain steps you have to take to keep them safe and that's it. But they weren't willing to do any of that. So it makes you feel horrible because people aren't willing to take that extra step for your son because he's a little bit different on the inside. This is almost like the last chance that we have to really affect change and um, get her which, to a place where she can have a fantastic life. And so we're not only helping this one, you know, individual person, but hopefully with this case will also um, impact uh, thousands of students and creates greater systemic change so that what happened to her will never happen to another child again. Disability rights means that everybody has equal access to our society, um, that everybody is able to thrive, um, that nobody is discriminated against because of their disability. Of all the civil rights fights that we've had in this country over the years, it seems like Perhaps our last frontier is the fight for uh, the rights of people with disabilities. It really has the goal of making people with disabilities full and equal member of our societies. People with disabilities are the canaries in the coal mine for all of us. So we always knew that people with disabilities were being excluded from educational technology and online education. And then the pandemic hit and that it has that lack of accessibility to educational technology and online learning is now affecting all of us and particularly people with disabilities there was different lawyers i went to different things i went to and no one wanted to take the case it took me like three months to find finally find mary Vargas and the drlc and everything and i'm glad that i kept fighting i think the disabled community is a little bit in danger of being forgotten right now the fight for people with disabilities tells us who we are as a people uh, and, and whether we are going to be able to uh, champion the rights of people who, um, you know, up until now have, have been marginalized and haven't been provided for. So um, I'm looking forward to a future where DRLC will be a big part of that conversation. The Disability Rights Legal Center is an important organization to to have because there just isn't enough information out there for people with disabilities to understand what their rights are. An organization that will provide free legal services, again, to people with disabilities or their loved ones so that they can make sure that their rights are being looked out after um, is just priceless. More, you know, maybe now than ever at a time when the world and our whole community is is hurting and going through a difficult time. It's important to think about, you know, how we take care of one another. And the DRLC very much does that. It's an honor to be the voice for the voiceless. And that's what the DRC um, is all about. I'm so inspired by all the voices that come together and recognize the amazing community um, that we've put together supporting people with disabilities. And to me, it's a reminder that 
disability rights is supporting all of us. It's supporting those of us who may have a disability someday. It's leading, as Eve said, in a way that is going to help everybody and recognizing those um, who are being marginalized right now and who are the signal to who could be marginalized next. Um, and, you know, often, you know, in that fight, we forget about long-term illnesses um, and particularly cancer. And at the DRLC, that's a really important part of what we do. Um, one of our programs, the Cancer Legal Resource Center, is the only national hotline um, who is available 24 hours a day for somebody to call um, and get in touch with an attorney to provide them with legal information. And you know, it's a reminder to us why donors like Jackson Lewis and Christine Min, both who supported at the $10,000 level, um, why we do what we do and how we keep that hotline open. And so, you know, in a, in a way that we can recognize their support and other major donor support, you know, we'd ask that you consider a donation of $100 to honor someone that you may have known with cancer. You can do that right now on our page. If you give, there's an ability to tribute and you can send an email um, to a person or a family member or a loved one that knows someone with cancer. Um, and you can share with them about the CLRC's work and why reminding them why legal information may not be the first thing that you think of when you receive a, can a cancer diagnosis, but still nonetheless an incredibly important one. And so tonight I'm joined by the CLRC staff and a few community members that, that work in this space to, to say um, a little bit about what the CLRC has been doing this 2020 and, and why that works important as well. The CLRC is a Cancer Legal Resource Center. We're a program of Disability Rights Legal Center. Uh, we provide free legal information and resources to anybody affected by cancer. All of our services are free nationwide and they're also confidential. We're helping people in their time of need. We have a professional panel where we engage uh, legal professionals from across the country who are licensed in so many different states that can help in so many different specialty areas. We're community collaborators. We've uh, shared uh, technical expertise. Our partnership with CRLC is great. It's, you know, I've, I've worked with you guys for over 10 years. The Cancer Legal Resource Center is the only national legal hotline for people with cancer. If there's a legal issue that's keeping someone awake up at night, they can just go online and fill out an intake and know that we will get that intake and be able to help them. We get calls related to COVID on a, on a very frequent basis right now. I think one of the things that we've been trying to do is sort of stay on the pulse of all the changes that are happening. There was actually someone who had contacted the CLRC who uh, revealed their cancer diagnosis to their supervisor and then shortly thereafter their supervisor said that they were being fired. They contacted the CLRC and we were able to provide them with more information so that they felt that at least they knew their rights and could proceed in the way that was best for them. But by providing them with information, there are so many times when someone will, even online, uh, express how grateful they are for the Cancer Legal Resource Center. A lot of people are worried about the treatment, but they don't really think about the financial toxicity that comes with the cancer, the legal issues, the work accommodations, even working with social services and getting some type of income. We have a plethora of resources available on our website on these topics. Um, it expands from disability insurance to health insurance, financial assistance, um, employment rights. The first person we refer to is the Cancer Legal Resource Center. We have you guys on speed dial. Well, our patient legal handbook comes in English and Spanish. Uh, it's widely distributed to all sorts of medical centers, patient navigators, social workers. Some of the topics that are covered are employment, um, housing, health insurance, um, also financial assistance. It's sort of just something that someone's not sure what might come up if you get sort of leaf through it. I've given that out to many patients. Often when we hear back from folks saying, you know, thank you for calling me back. I've called so many numbers. You're the first person who called me back. I've sifted through so many resources. Just the five to 10 minutes that you took to speak with me means so much. I refer a lot of people because I know there's a Spanish speaking person that's gonna answer their call. We are able to support them in a way that makes them feel that they're maybe not alone. We get hundreds of calls from people every week and they are in uh, oftentimes a state of crisis, a state of unknowing and being able to be there for them, listen to them and provide them with some clarity 
in the, in their time of of confusion and 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 hurt is is extremely extremely satisfying. It is personally so meaningful to be able to to help in some way, to be able to be an empathetic listener and to use legal knowledge as well as just the re resources out there to be able to find a way to look at the problem as an issue that one can consider and potentially uh, address with or without a lawyer. And to have that sense of empowerment for someone that in that moment, um, when they are scared, when they are fearful, can have that support, that is extraordinary. And to work with a team that is hardworking, empathetic, and incredibly smart is also incredibly meaningful. I love our community and I feel that the Cancer Legal Research Center is vital as well as Coleman to really help our women, help our communities, you know, address some of the disparities, some of the, the needs that they have. Thank you so much um, to the American Cancer Society and Amgen's Breakaway from Cancer for sponsoring the Patient Legal Handbook. It, it is an amazing resource that gets into thousands of people's hands yearly. Thank you so much to Gilead Sciences Foundation for your support of this event. Thank you everyone for, for attending the FDR dinner. Thank you for coming to the FDR dinner. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. There is no cure for cancer yet, but there is a cure for not knowing one's legal rights. And that's the Cancer Legal Resource Center. You know, that video is such a stark reminder that cancer affects so many people and so many issues continue to confront us in 2020. Um, you know, obviously the pandemic is first and foremost in our minds, but certainly just a few months ago, the Black Lives Matter movement was equally part of that conversation and equally part about what we were thinking about. And, you know, at the DRLC, we support the civil rights of everybody, which includes people with disabilities. And what we've known and seen as part of these pro protests is that people with disabilities are being left out of that conversation and that they are being stripped of their First Amendment rights and their ability to protest in the same way as everybody else. Um, and so the efforts of, of a case that we've just brought forward um, is one that's supported by you know, our, our sponsors like Davis Ray Tremaine, like Marissa Song and her family, um, Pillsbury, Epic, um, Gail Glick and NBC Universal, and you know the support of these donors allows us to take cases just like this one, that are ensuring that we are allowing for people with disabilities to protest and have access, just like everybody else. And so, I'd like you for you all to hear tonight from those people that we are representing directly, what their experiences have been like, um, and why a case like this is such an important one for the DRLC to take up. Somewhere around June and into July is when the police violence really started to escalate. In, in the early weeks when it was some of the craziest stuff going on, like I could hear the echoes of flashbangs out my window. There happened to be a uh, candlelight vigil on the square that night um, in July for um, Summer Taylor, the person up in Seattle who was run over and killed by a car when holding space um, for a Black Lives Matter protest. The police had um, spoken or ordered a wheelchair user uh, to do something. And they said, you just need to go home. You shouldn't be here at this protest. You just need to go home. And when I, when that was said, that was a threat. That was a threat to everybody in the disability community. Knowing people I know, people I know through work, people I know through school, people I know off the street, just, just people I know are out there. And during that vigil, um, some uh, federal agents stormed into um, the park, ran through the vigil, throwing flashbang grenades. My First Amendment rights had been revoked, I felt like, so I didn't have freedom of speech. And then I'm considering, you know, I, as a person with a disability, it's, there are added dangers to me being out there. And at first that actually kept me at home. You know, I lost my vision when I was four years old due to an illness. When Wheeler had the audacity to say, oh, I have provided interpreters for this evening. I 
was like, you know what, let's call him out. And it was on camera. And I said, no, you're wrong. I was the one who actually provided the interpreter for this evening. And one of those grenades they threw directly at me and my service dog, Wallace. And I looked for other ways that I could support and contribute and help the people on the ground. I had been shot myself as well uh, in the back. Um, I was all right. It was definitely a scary experience, but I, I ended up being okay. Um, and there was no protest happening in that space. There was no you know, reason to believe we were at any sort of risk for anything. Internally, I'm. I want to be out there. I. I want to be fighting the fight because that's 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 who I am. We were afraid of being beaten up or uh, abused by the police and being arrested. It was because of that that I found myself around that federal building, drawing property lines in chalk, so that I knew where I could stand legally um, on city property and not on federal property so that I would be able to express my First Amendment rights. A friend of mine, one of the people who I had been supporting with information, asked me, so Katie, do you ever actually want to go out to the protests, like in person, physically? And I responded to them, you know, yeah, of course I do. That's that's part of why I'm doing what I do is because I want to go out there. But with my blindness, here's all this huge list of reasons why it's actually dangerous. For me. If we were to be arrested, where in that process of being booked and our Miranda rights read to us, where's the interpreter? Where would the interpreter be? I was really trying to find out information about what they had done to my service dog while we were in a city park during open hours, participating in a candlelight vigil. And after I finished listing all that off, this friend just responded, so you do want to go out then? <laughs> uh, that's the point where I was like, well, yeah, so how are we going to make all this work? One interpreter who did, in fact, get arrested. Um, and so at that moment they were arrested, that immediately took away our access to what was going on. And it was while I was doing that, drawing the property lines, that they came out again a few days later and kidnapped me in Wallace. I happened to know myself, and I happened to know that if blindness wasn't a barrier for me, I would be out there in this protest scene putting my body on the line. Like, I have that spirit. And so when I realized that my blindness is the thing that's holding me back, not anything else, I said, uh-uh, I have to fix that. It might not be that there's a, you know, policy directive to target disabled individuals, but federal agents who feel empowered to do things like hold disabled people separated from their service dog for nine hours without a phone call, and even threaten to euthanize their service dog as a means to hold them longer. What I saw, my own eyes, and what I experienced myself, and then what I'm seeing with what's happening with the Black Lives Matter protests really, really speaks volumes. So um, I'm in it to fight and I'm fighting for a better future for all. As an American, I have a right to protest. I have a right to civil disobedience. I have a right to stand up and, and say out loud what I believe in and what I stand for, just like everyone else. We should expect that these rights should be granted to all people and we should work to break down the barriers that limit folks who are in these marginalized groups from taking advantage of those rights and so rather than talk about should disabled people be allowed to protest we should be talking about what is preventing disabled people from being able to protest because that's where we need to be targeting things. Because all people should have the right to protest. All people should have the right to public spaces, whether it's during the protest or after the protest. Um, and that's regardless of their disability or ability. It's regardless of any other characteristic. As Americans, but as human beings, we respect those rights in each other. You know, I'm deeply moved by DRLC's effort to take on these cases. We we believe that disability rights are civil rights and the ability to join these cases and these concepts together in a way that is unique and innovative, but still critical 
uh, is such an important part of our work. And, you know, I, I certainly want to make sure that I, I point out Brendan Hammy, who personally sought out this case. He, he joined the DRLC from the ACLU and protesting and these kind of cases are really what he, what he has grown up on. Um, and he found a way to bring those concepts together at the DRLC and, and we're forever thankful for that. But amazing work is being done by the CLRC staff, by our administrative staff, but also the rest of our team working on the civil rights project and, and one that takes up litigation and special education cases throughout LA. They're being led by our amazing litigation director, Chris Knopf, um, who is being supported by senior staff attorney, Alexander Robertson, along with Brendan Hammy, um, who I just referenced, our, our staff attorneys, Anthony Pajera and Julie Stromberg, along with a law fellow, Alora Howard. And their efforts this year, I think, have been extraordinary. The challenges that we've faced having to be working from home, having to figure out how we're going to represent these families, how we're going to help the people that are the most vulnerable in our society, that's really important. And so, um, you know, I'd like to share with you via video next a little bit about some of the other matters and cases that the DRLC has been working on this year. Um, and I'd encourage you to consider making a contribution if, if you hear about a case or um, a matter that is that seems like the kind of thing that, that you want to support tonight. We handle the civil rights litigation here at DRLC, uh, representing individuals, organizations, class actions, you name it, to enforce the rights of people with disabilities for people to be able to have a level playing field, to have equal opportunity at providing for themselves and their lives, living independently, and basically improving the quality of life. Eliminating discrimination on the basis of disability often involves substantial economic impact. You gotta build the ramp, right? You gotta install the, the special hardware in, in the bathroom. And there's an economic cost to that. So in some ways, I think the fight that we have to ensure a level playing field and fundamental fairness for people with disabilities, I think in some respects, it, it, it encounters even bigger hurdles. I found out it's an organization called Disability Center that was happy to provide pro bono opportunities where you could serve as a lawyer um, and provide pro bono work helping parents in IEPs. For those who do not know what that is, it stands for Individualized Education Programs. And it's a legal contract that parents and students will enter into with their school district to provide accommodations and services. What's so amazing about the DRLC's work is that we represent students who need the most help. The IDEA is really designed for students who have like, come from, you know, a regular family setting, mom, dad. Unfortunately for a lot of students, they don't have that. With a typically developing child, you go sign them up for whatever preschool that has a short wait list or, you know, whatever the case may be, but you're not necessarily having to go through this list of questions like, can they support my child and what she needs? Um, and so from sort of the beginning, right, it, it's about advocating through IEPs, making sure um, a child with a disability is supported in school and getting what they what they are legally entitled to and what they need. Pillsbury was very pleased to assist with a big win for the DRLC in the Pomona Unified School District case. Um, this was an uh, important case uh, where we helped to vindicate the rights of um, parents and children with disabilities who were the victims of improper training, incomplete training. Impact litigation really moves the ball forward. DRLC is important because it does high impact litigation that not everybody can do. You need a team of people who are experts in the law and who have the support of private law firms and other resources to bring the big important cases, the cases where somebody's going to fight back. So those are really important. And the Disability Rights Legal Center is one of the few places in the country that can do that and that does do that. I am spending my days ensuring that um, public entities, private uh, individuals will abide by the policies, statutes, 
and uh, rules that already exist for the protection of people living with disabilities that too often get ignored. DRLC's current cases are a variety. We have cases in the transportation area, physical access at, um, at hotels and airports, um, higher education is a big focus of ours, uh, helping folks with disabilities get the accommodations they need to achieve at the level of their capabilities as opposed to being denied the ability to succeed because of their disabilities. It's her looking at me and being sad that she can not access to something. And like, we can't fix the walking piece. I can't snap my fingers and make that easier for her, but the access piece we're supposed to be able to fix. So for me, that, that really is, that's the work that we are here to do. A deaf gentleman uh, in higher education who was denied accommodations was forced to drop out. That gentleman is going to be re-enrolling in the institution and pursuing uh, his career goals. There isn't anybody to make sure this happens except us. We have to do it ourselves. A young boy um, at a music school who was summarily terminated from the program because of his autism and we were able to resolve that on behalf of the family. A woman who tried to take her son to a, a water park in La Mirada. And um, her son's diabetic and he needed a special meal and they would not let her bring outside food into the water park. DRLC is really excited to be heading to the Ninth Circuit on behalf of a uh, woman with a psychiatric disability uh, who has a service animal. Um, and we're hopeful that the Ninth Circuit is going to rule and reaffirm the right of people with disabilities to go to various public accommodations, including hospitals, with their service animal, not be separated from it, and more importantly, to recognize the right that is under the law, allowing people to train their own service animals. I would just tell them to keep fighting. I mean, it's worth it. I mean, the whole time, I didn't even think Sebastian was gonna get into school for preschool, because people don't see preschool as a necessity. I can't tell you how proud I am of the DRLC staff and I thank them for all that they do every single day. I'm really grateful for all the work that you all do and for all the funders that are a part of this because without you, we can't do this work. And finally, we will arrive at our awardees for the evening and I'll be part of this next video, but I can't say enough about Crip Camp, the documentary, the story it shared and the passion and the energizing work that is being done or was being done through the disability rights movements over all these years. I was pleased to be able to speak with Judy Human, Jim Lebrecht, and Nicole Noonan for their roles and to present them with this year's FDR awards. And um, I'd like to share that with you tonight. I'm so honored to have with us um, tonight, Judy Human, who is just a, a beacon of disability rights and as an activist and so much more. And so, you know, we're honored to have you here and to present you with our 2020 FDR award um, as one of our awardees, along with Jimmy and Nicole, um, and um, to recognize you, you're a world renowned disability rights activist. You've led the way for people with disabilities here in the United States, but then you've taken that beyond the realm of the United States to other countries. Um, your work at the UN in on the treaty um, that it still hasn't been ratified but needs to be um, hopefully very soon your work on the IDEA the 504 sit in um, you know so much more um, you know we're, we're just so lucky to have you here with us and so lucky for you to be leading kind of the work that we're doing now um, and the activism that we're doing so I'm honored to present you with our our 2020 award thank you and I really you know want to say that we all know that no one person makes a movement grow and it's never one person that um, makes laws and implements them. So I feel you know, really proud that I've been able over, I guess really 60 years of my life, 55 to I've had the opportunity to meet so many great disabled people. And I think, for those of you who haven't seen Crip Camp, and for those of you who have, who might want to go back and see it again, I think you know one of the very important parts of Crip Camp 
is that it really shows the emergence of the voices of disabled people. You have the right to express yourself and you have the right to live a life where uh, the expectation is not discrimination that gets unresolved. So I think Crip Camp, my book, Alice Wong, many other people are working in this area really demonstrate that we can both individually and coming together um, fight for change, fight for change in the disability community. And also, as you were saying about this litigation, uh, what's important is that you have disabled people working in the Black Lives Matter movement, being involved in protests, feeling you know that their voices matter and uh, that it's important for their rights to be protected so that they have the same right to um, uh, freedom of speech as others. I'm pleased to present um, as part of our 45th FDR Awards Dinner, um, another one of our awards to the co-directors of Crip Camp. Um, they join international disability rights advocate Judy Human as one of our as two of our honorees this year. Um, and it seems really fitting to us at the DRLC that during these times in this pandemic, when we're all safer at home right now, uh, but usually would be together in person, that we've got a chance to award co-directors who were asked to release um, their film in an online streaming format for the same reason. Um, you know, we chose to award Jim and Nicole um, because Crip Camp is this energizing story of the disability revolution, and it brings to life the early stories of the disability rights movement. Um, their work in sharing the story that is the bedrock of what DRLC does each day is critical for continuing to move forward in the disability rights space um, every day for organizations like the DRLC. And so from Camp Jeanette to the 504 sit-in, we hope this story continues to fold in new supporters into the ongoing civil rights movement. And we are just so pleased to honor Jim and Nicole with this award. This is a, a wonderful um, honor. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we knew that we had a story that we felt that the world uh, really needed to see that. Um, and so to have this kind of recognition and to know that our story is out there um, and being appreciated is so gratifying. And this award, especially coming from within the community is remarkable. So thank you. I just want to join Jim in saying how honored I feel and how happy I feel because it really was our dream all the way through the process of making the film that we would make a film that people in the community and people doing the work would be able to use and would feel was um, authentically representative, you know, of, of the experience of the story of the struggle um, and of kind of the values of the movement. And so, um, to receive this particular honor is, is deeply, deeply meaningful to us. I said to Nicole, but you know, Nicole, I, uh, I've actually wanted to see a documentary about my summer camp. I think there's a connection here. The story of these people from New York coming out to Berkeley and the connection to the disabled civil rights movement. I think there's an important story there that I, I just, I really hope doesn't get lost to talking. When Jim started describing the camp to me, I, I, I was very excited because I had never imagined um, a community like the one that he described. Um, and, you know, this sort of empowered group of budding young activists um, in a, a egalitarian kind of hippie utopia, um, you know, in 1969, just down the road from Woodstock. But it seemed like this story was one that would enable people to just kind of like dive into a world that they were not familiar with necessarily, but that they would find fun and, and appealing and universal. And that that then offered a, um, a jumping off point to kind of like um, shift perception around disability so that when telling the story of this civil rights movement, which the more Jim talked about it and I read about, I realized really had not seen the light of day cinematically in the way that it should have, um, given the importance that it's had to the entire world. Um, you know, that we could actually make people not only come to know that story, but come to see it in the way that they ought to see it and might not otherwise.
finally is, you know, we close tonight. I want to thank everybody who supported this event. I want to ask everybody to consider one final contribution this evening. And I want to leave you with a special thank you from the other members of the DRLC. Some people think they didn't know the ADA just happened. They didn't live through that time in their lives or 504 or idea, you know, they, they, you know, the, these were very, very hard pieces of law and legislation to get passed with huge struggles. And, but we have to protect them every day. And that's the work that you folks are doing. You were protecting the blood, sweat, and tears of those people that were inside that building or who had helped pass the ADA through your work. And I would like to think that there's a day in which that's not going to be necessary, but that's not that we know from history. And if history is any lesson, that's not the case. And so I would just say, I, I so deeply appreciate your organization and the fight that you folks are involved with every day. And it is vitally important, not just for people with disabilities, but really truly for everyone because disability is a natural part of life. And we all have someone in our lives with a disability and it affects us. So thank you for this honor, but you know, just keep going. I'd like to really thank um, everybody that has been part of this event that helps to sponsor DRLC and the work that we do. Um, your contributions, whether financial or time-wise, are invaluable. Thank you everybody so much. When you support the Disability Rights Legal Center, you're supporting every person with a disability across the country. Thanks for everyone for being here tonight. It's a really exciting time for us at the DRLC and we hope that you think so too. For all of your support to date, we could not do what we do. Thanks very much. Take care and be well. The DRLC has my heart because of the good work it does. Thank you so much for attending the FDR dinner.